Hello everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Precision Medicine Approaches and the Future of Drug Development in Oncology, presented by Dr. Thomas Metcalf. I'm Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking site and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration and learning. We'd also like to acknowledge the C and EN Media Group for help with promote programming and promotion of the event. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of our presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left hand corner of your web page and follow the process for obtaining your credits. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Thomas Metcalf. Dr. Metcalf is the head of the Science and Technology Incubator Translational Research Sciences, Roche Pharma, and the chair of Personalized Medicine Task Force, European Biopharmaceutical Enterprises. He works on projects around the world to advance precision medicine. If you would like more information about Dr. Metcalf, please click on his photo image in the top right. The planners for this event have stated no relevant financial relationships. However, Dr. Kevin Davies did disclose that he is a scientific advisory board member for Pathway Genomics and is on the Speakers Bureau for Harry Walker Incorporated and that neither constitute a, a conflict. Please note that Dr. Metcalf has indicated that he has no relevant financial relationships pertaining to this topic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas Metcalf. I'll now turn it over to Tom for his presentation. Thank you for the introduction, Brenda, um, and thank you for the invitation to make this presentation today. I've got to make a, actually a, a slight correction to that in terms of disclosures. Um, I am a, an employee and a stockholder of, uh, of Hoffman La Roche, and that um, presents a potential conflict of interest. Uh, so um, uh, it's important, I think, that you're aware of that. Um, and I'd like to stress that the contents of this presentation represent my personal views and not necessarily those of Roche. Um, so I'm going to be talking about precision medicine approaches and the future of drug development in oncology. Um, precision medicine approaches are giving us much greater resolution in the analysis we can do of genes, gene transcripts and proteins in oncology. And this, if we, particularly if we are able to link it effectively via databases with uh, treatments and treatment outcomes and related um, real world data sets will allow us to revolutionize the way we treat cancer and will potentially lead to a blurring of the lines between clinical trials and clinical care. Um, I want to start with a short introduction about uh, next gen sequencing and its potential impact on drug development, particularly on oncology. Um, Next-gen sequencing and similar molecular technologies are changing the way that drugs are discovered and developed. The impacts are many and varied. Um, diseases are being defined uh, in molecular terms with many diseases being split into micro indications. New targets are being identified, leading to new candidate medicines. Preclinical models are being characterized by next-gen sequencing, leading to better drug candidates. And its uh, next-gen sequencing is also being integrated into drug trials, uh, changing the way we develop biomarkers, companion diagnostics, and uh, personalized medicines. Um, uh, next-gen sequencing is, is also um, being actively used in clinical practice, uh, particularly in rare diseases and oncology. Uh, the cost of the technology is evolving rapidly. Um, 
And uh, if you look at this chart, you can see uh, um, that the cost of a, essentially a raw sequence of a human genome has dropped to about the cost of uh, um, $1,000 today um, and continues to uh, drop in cost at a rate faster than Moore's law. So this is a, um, an extremely uh, um, uh, advanced uh, um, reduction in the cost of, uh, of next-gen sequ next sequencing. As I said, next-gen sequencing and other molecular technologies are used in uh, drug discovery and development, and they extend beyond genome sequencing. Um, so there's uh, um, technologies such as uh, transcript, uh, transcriptomics, um, uh, which allow us to look at, uh, and, uh, and next-gen sequencing, which allow us to look at point mutations, um, small indels, copy number variation, and structural variations. Uh, which are, uh, um, also allow us to understand the functional effects of mutations. As I say, transcriptomics, um, particularly uh, using techniques such as RNA-seq, allow us to understand differential expression of transcripts, um, also gene fusions, alternative splicing, and RNA editing. And then epigenomic approaches also under allow us to understand the methylation, histone modification, um, and transcription uh, factor binding, which together give us a very deep understanding not only of uh, um, the genes which are being uh, expressed at any particular time or uh, the, the, the tumor genome, but also the way that tumor genome is being uh, actively expressed and to a large extent the, uh, uh, the functional role of those genes um, in the tumor. And uh, next-gen sequencing allows us to get a, a comprehensive view of the somatic genome and, as I said, the transcriptome. Um, so these are the various uh, analyses which are um, currently possible to perform on relatively small samples. Um, so as you can see, a biopsy will yield um, something like eight to ten slides. And two slides of these, uh, of each of these biopsy can be used for RNA uh, for DNA analysis, RNA analysis, and protein analysis. Um, and this, um, together with a clinical informatics system, can give us a, a very rich understanding of how a tumor is, uh, is behaving and what, its, uh, and what its makeup is. If we look at this uh, um, in the context of lung cancer and how we'd previously um, conceptualized lung cancer or looked at lung cancer and our understanding of um, the molecular drivers in cancer as uh, um, only as recently as 2004, really the only understanding we had was in terms of KRAS uh, mutations and EGFR mutations in cancer. And this has advanced rapidly over um, the last few years um, to give us a, a, a much more nuanced understanding of the molecular drivers in lung cancer um, with now about uh, something like 65% of lung cancers being described in terms of the molecular um, drivers which are, which are described here. And more recently, um, as we've uh, introduced um, immunotherapies, we begin to get an understanding of how uh, the um, response to immunotherapies um, relates to, uh, to, uh, to the... Uh, molecular makeup of the, the, the tumor. And so this gives us a, a much more complex and rich picture of the um, molecular underpinnings of, of lung cancer and, uh, and makes, um, it's extremely informational, but it makes a treatment decision making um, more complex as the picture of lung cancer becomes more complex. And we're beginning to move now to a um, essentially a um, moving from a histological um, view of cancer to something which is um, much more uh, molecular in nature and arriving at a, a new molecular ta taxonomy of, of cancer as a, um, as a result of the use of these uh, molecular profiling techniques such as um, exome seq, um, RNA seq. Um, the use of SNP arrays and uh, methylation arrays. Um, and we're moving from 
Uh, for instance, uh, as um, looking again at, uh, at lung cancer, um, previously we described as squamous-like in, or in, uh, in head and neck cancer, to uh, having a much better understanding of what the molecular drivers are of these diseases. We've also um, begun to conceptualize and understand um, cancers in a different way as we bega began to get a deeper understanding of the genomic um, uh, complexity underlying many cancers. Um, we're seeing that um, inter-patient heterogeneity um, means that every patient's lung cancer is essentially different with no two um, lung cancers having exactly the same genomic makeup. There may be um, uh, patterns which have a high degree of overlap, um, but uh, there's, uh, as I say, no two will have exactly the same genomic makeup. And we're also seeing that there's much more intratumor uh, heterogeneity than we'd previously thought, with solid tumors made up of many um, tens, hundreds, maybe even more than that, subclones, each one genomically different to the next. And this is what allows genomically diverse tumors to evolve under therapy with new clones growing, which do not depend on the genomic alteration, which was originally targeted by one therapy, and thus to, um, to escape um, therapy by evolution. And uh, we've begun to understand that this genomic heterogeneity increases over time and progresses, obviously, more rapidly in the absence of tumor suppressor genes um, DNA repair enzymes, et cetera, et cetera. And we're beginning to see that um, next generation sequencing is beginning to be used more routinely in clinical practice, um, particularly uh, in the US, but also in, in other geographies. Uh, and this is an example of the, um, the Foundation One report uh, or solid tumors, which is um, produced by Foundation Medicine, which gives an overview of um, the patient results, the tumor type, um, the uh, genomic alterations which have been identified, and then the therapeutic implications of, uh, of targeted medicines, which may be able to address the, um, uh, the tumor drivers and genomic aberrations which have been identified in this particular patient's cancer. And this then gives a guide to treating oncologists about whether or not a particular therapy will be appropriate for this patient. Also, whether um, there are clinical trials available um, which the, uh, the patient can potentially be enrolled in. And uh, next-gen sequencing is also being rapidly incorporated into the way we develop drugs. Here's an example of a uh, um, the lung map trial with a, a number of sub-studies for treatment um, where um, patients with um, squamous cell uh, lung cancer are enrolled and the first thing that is done is that the tumor uh, sample is analyzed and then patients are allocated to um, baskets depending on the molecular subtype and treated accordingly or enrolled in sub-studies um, according to the uh, mutations uh, and molecular um, uh, aberrations which are, are present in their, in their cancer. So you can see there uh, five different um, baskets which are, um, which are in this uh, um, lung map trial with a number of sub-studies, each, as I said, with their own um, basket of molecular characteristics and uh, and appropriate treatments for those um, uh, for those baskets. And as we are beginning to um, get a more comprehensive understanding of the um, genomic underpinnings of uh, of cancer, uh, we're um, beginning to see that the, um, uh, as I say, a much more complex picture of cancer is arising, and. Uh, Again, this is a um, uh, this is a, a picture of uh, lung cancer, and you can see the enormous number of mutations with a, an extremely long tail out to the uh, the right hand side of that chart of relatively rare mutations. 
And this is uh, beginning to, to show us that uh, although there are um, a number of molecular subtypes which are relatively dominant on the, the, the left-hand side, um, there, are a, uh, there is an, an extremely long tail of relatively rare um, molecular subtypes, as I say, as we move out to the, the right-hand side of this chart. And this um, is beginning to tell us that uh, for these rarer subtypes, it's going to be um, quite complex to, um, to develop clinical trials which are targeted at these rare subtypes because simply because of the, um, the rarity of the mutation with maybe um, patients of a particular subtype um, only representing something like one or two percent or, uh, or, or uh, um, a very low percentage of the overall number of lung cancer patients. And if we follow traditional methods of um, developing drugs in these uh, in these rare subtypes, it's going to be extremely challenging to recruit sufficient patients to, um, to power a, uh, a reasonably sized trial. And uh, we're already seeing there's uh, logistical difficulties in, um, in recruiting patients for these, uh, with, with these relatively rare, rare subtypes. And uh, um, we're having to rethink the way we develop um, biomarkers uh, in this area, and also the way that we run trials. Um, and one uh, difference that we are um, beginning to apply here, or one different approach that we're beginning to apply, is we're beginning to think that um, instead of uh, organizing a study, um, recruiting patients with a particular um, anatomical uh, disease or a, uh, a particular um, subtype of disease and then um, screening patients for particular biomarkers as we recruit for that trial, that it may be best to turn this paradigm around slightly and as a first step to, um, to essentially perform a comprehensive molecular an analysis of a, a much broader um, basket of or a much broader um, population of patients and then to run trials accordingly as these baskets fill up with, uh, um, with patients with those molecular subtypes. And uh, as I said, this is a, a previous conceptualization of how we might, understand, how we might develop uh, companion diagnostics or biomarkers uh, to develop a personalized healthcare approach uh, in, on in oncology where, uh, as you can see on the bottom half of this chart, uh, what we would like to do is uh, identify um, a biomarker relatively early um, in the process, essentially before we, um, before we enter into human trials and to start developing an analytical platform um, for this biomarker such that we have a relatively robust uh, biomarker assay, which can then be converted into a companion diagnostic in the time, fa in the time frame of the drug development. Um, and uh, as I say, if you um, rethink this and you um, begin to understand the, first of all, the complexity of the genomic alterations which we're seeing in, uh, um, in many cancers, and you, uh, um, you realize that uh, um, developing single biomarkers in this way into, com uh, into companion diagnostics um, becomes um, extremely difficult. And uh, that this conceptualization of biomarker development and personalized healthcare can only be really applied to, uh, to those biomarkers which are further to the right-hand side of the the chart that I previously showed you here, where um, they are essentially um, dominant biomarkers or dominant drivers in a particular cancer type. Um, for those rarer um, alterations further to the left, uh, sorry, further to the right hand side of this chart, we're going to have to think of different approaches to, to developing biomarker assays um, um, and companion diagnostics. 
we're also seeing that uh, um, next generation sequencing can be applied to circulating tumor DNA um, as a potential method for um, monitoring patients who are on treatment or um, monitoring for the uh, for a, a, a rising of, uh, of certain cancer types. And these liquid biopsies, which are essentially um, on a, a blood-based sample, provide a, um, a minimally invasive method to, um, to measure mutant alleles in, in cancer-bearing patients. Um, we know that circulating tumor DNA can be found in the majority of cancer-bearing patients to various degrees. And a, um, a pre-screening liquid biopsy may uh, provide an up-to-date snapshot into the genetic landscape of patients entering clinical trials so that um, we can essentially get a, a confirmation um, from uh, the analysis that we did on the, uh, on the diagnostic uh, biopsy, which was, uh, um, which was taken more or less at a, a presentation or diagnosis, so that we get an, a relatively accurate picture through this pre-screening liquid biopsy of the, uh, the cancer's genomic nature um, as we enter into, clin uh, into, uh, into clinical trials. And it, um, um, it may give us a more accurate representation of tumor heterogeneity because we're not taking a geographically specific sample from, uh, um, from a tumor. And lastly, it presents a, um, a very um, powerful tool for patient monitoring enabling us to detect uh, resistant clones um, as they arise when a patient is on therapy and essentially to be able to monitor whether or not uh, um, uh, a, a cancer is escaping from the targeted therapy which, uh, which is being applied and therefore uh, adapt uh, therapy before symptoms um, occur. So we can, at a very early stage in the um, in the appearance of these resistant clones, we can potentially make an adaptation of the therapy. So if you look at the, uh, the outcomes from uh, next-gen sequencing-based molecular testing and how this uh, um, affects clinical trials and the standard of care, um, if no actionable alterations are detected, then uh, one would normally apply uh, best supportive care or perhaps um, immunotherapy or potentially rebiopsy to try and uh, um, identify actionable orientations. If we have actionable alterations which are identified, so there's a, a clear identification of a, a genomic driver, this can be matched to approved agents from the same tumor type. So uh, we know that not all um, drivers uh, uh, behave the same uh, um, in different histologies. So obviously if we have the same tumor type, for instance, from a, a lung cancer, um, this might not um, behave the same way as a particular driver in, for instance, a gastric cancer. So uh, if we have actionable orientations which are in the same tumor type, we can then um, use uh, um, developed and access agents which are targeted against these rare mutations. If we have uh, actionable orientations which um, which um, can be matched to investigational agents from the same tumor. That gives us then a path forward. And if we have actionable orientations which are identified but no match to, uh, uh, but a match to agents in a different tumor, we can potentially um, uh, use a registry approach to, um, to, to monitor this. And if we have actionable orientations which um, uh, can be matched to investigational agents with a different tumor, we can perhaps look at uh, running a clinical trial, basket studies, or other similar approaches. So um, using NGS-based uh, uh, analyses and uh, these um, precision methodologies to molecularly profile tro um, uh, uh, patients gives us, a, uh, I think, a very strong toolbox to, um, to understand whether or not patients are best treated using um, currently available therapies or are um, enrolled into clinical trials where, um, where investigational agents may be available, which are better targeted to the, um, the molecular drivers which have been identified in their tumor. Um, 
there have been authors who've uh, suggested that um, large-scale randomized clinical trials uh, may long, no longer be, be practical or ethical, uh, ethical in cohorts which have been divine, uh, defined by um, uh, next generation sequencing. And this is principally because um, we are getting such a, uh, um, first of all, a rich overview of uh, a particular patient and um, we are seeing that no two patients are uh, alike that are defining cohorts where um, essentially the clinical hypothesis is that all the patients in this cohort are essentially the same and then um, testing a, a therapeutic regimen which is based upon this hypothesis. Um, as I say, uh, we are seeing now that every patient is essentially different so that um, it may be time for us to, um, to move beyond this hypothesis that, uh, um, that uh, we have a cohort where all the patients for the, um, uh, for, for the um, you know, base of the, or the assumption is that the, all the patients in that cohort are essentially the same, um, this may no, no longer be true. And uh, um, how we would proceed with these one-person trials or N of one trials, um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done to, um, to describe how that could work. But uh, as I say, this is um, testing the limitations of um, uh, randomized clinical trial technology due to the um, precision with, with, with which we are able to molecularly describe patients using um, next-gen sequencing and, and similar molecular profiling technologies. Uh, this, I think, is one of the, um, uh, the factors which highlight the, uh, the fact that trial design and regulatory frameworks need to, be, uh, need to evolve to maximize the potential benefit of uh, next-gen sequencing and, and other therapeutic oh, sorry, and other, um, other innovations. If we think about the, uh, the evolution of the, um, the therapeutic alternatives, which we now have with multiple new small molecule inhibitors, with uh, second and third generation uh, molecular antibodies, with um, uh, checkpoint inhibitors and other immunotherapeutic approaches, um, now with uh, essentially with cancer vaccines, with um, T cell based therapies. So uh, we have now have a wide range of, uh, of therapeutic alternatives. We have um, profiling technologies such as uh, next gen sequencing um, and liquid biopsies. Uh, we have um, extensive uh, knowledge of the epidemiology of cancer, and we're beginning to be able to develop databases which link together treatment outcomes and, uh, um, and molecular profiles. And we can see the, um, the ability to begin to develop treatment algorithms which will allow us to match, um, optimally match patients to a uh, a therapy, um, as I described before, either a, an approved therapy or an investigational therapy. And our understanding of cancer in terms of its uh, heterogeneity um, from patient to patient and also within tumors, uh, this linked to our understanding of, uh, uh, of tumor pathways and tumor biology um, and tumor evolution. All of these things have advanced greatly However, our um, approaches to trial designs and regulatory approaches um, have changed little over the last 10 years. Uh, we've seen um, advances such as um, breakthrough designations and orphan drug uh, um, designations. We're looking more at uh, adaptive designs, but um, we need to think probably beyond this um, to look at other frameworks and other novel approaches, um, particularly if we're going to enable the, um, the use of novel combinations to treat patients and, as I say, to arrive at uh, optimal matches between a molecularly defined cancer and a, um, um, and a, a combination therapy. And we're beginning to envisage um, you know, what a, a model protocol could look like. Uh, the left-hand side of this chart shows the um, 
uh, the signature trial, um, which is being run by Novartis. Uh, we're also looking at a potential within Russia potential model, model protocols where we could have a, um, a master protocol which would um, enroll patients and do a molecular profiling um, with many substances, substudies. So we'd have um, next generation sequencing and other molecular um, profiling methodologies applied at recruitment. Um, we'd get a definition of disease, which is based upon um, a molecular definition and defined by pathways. Uh, we'd look to employ decentralized trial models to, um, to ensure that we uh, recruit as many patients as possible for rare cancer, um, uh, rare cancer subtypes. And we'd be also looking to follow adaptive um, designs and um, uh, um, adaptive licensing approaches to ensure that we, uh, we put um, treatments or potentially useful treatments in, in oncologists' hands as, uh, uh, as soon as possible and potentially open this approach to, um, to other sponsors so that we can not only look at, um, uh, at combinations which we could supply out of our own portfolio or combining standards of care with, uh, um, with our own investigational molecules but look at uh, um, potentially also using investigational molecules from other sponsors. So as I said, this is the um, potentially, new, uh, potentially new paradigm for, um, for, um, uh, for accelerating drug development in this area, um, using molecular characterization of, uh, of disease at enrollment, um, generating data for single agents and combination therapy in patient populations, which are defined by molecular subtype and histology, um, uh, classifying uh, uh, tumors using these um, cutting edge uh, molecular profiling toolkits and uh, prospectively defining uh, molecular and histolog histologic subsets for data outputs that are hypothesis generating and have the potential for registration. And we believe this would allow us to accelerate biomarker discovery and registration of novel combination therapies for these molecularly uh, classified diseases. However, we see there's um, significant infrastructure gaps if, uh, if this vision is to lead to population-wide benefits, particularly in terms of um, appropriate standard, uh, standards for the identification and reporting of actionable somatic genomic variants. Um, we would like to see uh, um, databases established which allow us to, um, uh, first of all, record uh, the um, genomic uh, variants which we, um, which we define in patients, but also record the patient responses on therapy um, so that we're able to match responses to genomic profiles um, to begin to use these data to develop uh, um, algorithms which can be clinically validated uh, to support matching of patients to therapies um, based upon uh, tumor molecular profiles and also to develop decision support systems to support physicians to access uh, relevant up-to-date data and to access um, treatment algorithms to, um, to support this uh, um, this matching of uh, therapies to molecular subtype. And lastly, uh, um, developing processes to allow companies to collaborate and to give treating oncologists access to a broad range of experimental therapies to allow them to treat patients with optimal combinations. And obviously, if we do this, then we're going to have to develop clinical programs and regulatory uh, frameworks to support these approaches allowing successful approaches to be commercialized. There's a number of uh, um, current major initiatives which are beginning to address some of these challenges. Um, I've got a, um, an overview of uh, um, some of these, which are um, particularly from a European perspective. So one of these is um, run by the EORTC. It's called uh, SPECTRE. And this is a proposal for a um, major um, collaborative molecular screening platform. Um, this has been uh, um, proposed by the URTC and is beginning to, um, 
to gain traction in Europe. Uh, it has um, a number of different platforms and uh, would provide a, a platform, as I said, to first of all to, uh, to screen patients and then to um, provide a platform for multiple sponsors to collaborate um, around uh, the molecularly defined populations which the SPECTRE program would define. Uh, the, many of the cancer core centers in, sorry, the cancer centers in Europe are beginning to collaborate to share, um, first of all, the epidemiological databases of the patients who um, are being treated at these cancer centers, but then also the outcomes data um, from uh, already registered therapies and experimental therapies, which they're seeing um, in these populations, as I said, to begin to link together um, the, uh, the data in terms of um, uh, cancer epidemiology and the, um, the, the, uh, the molecular profiles, and then the, um, the treatment outcomes which are achieved on therapy in these patients. Um, this has a number of, uh, the, the Cancer Core Europe has a number of key goals and objectives, which I'll uh, skip in the interest of time, um, but uh, if you, uh, they've got a, um, a website where you can um, review these goals and objectives. Um, and lastly, there's uh, a number of projects within the scope of the Innovation Medicines Initiative in Europe, uh, where um, big data for better outcomes projects um, are being developed to focus on a, um, or to, to develop an outcomes focused data platform to empower policymakers and clinicians to optimize their, their care for patients with, uh, in this case, patients with um, hematologic malignancies. So I think I'll, with, uh, with that, I'll conclude um, and uh, move to the, uh, um, the Q&A session and take any questions which you have. Thank you, Dr. Metcalf, for that informative presentation. As you said, it is time for our Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Metcalf, please do so now. You can click on the green Q&A button in the lower left of the presentation window, type your question in, and click send. We'll answer as many of your questions as we can. We'll get right to it. Our first question. It looks like target DNA sequencing, short reads sequencing, is good enough for clinic use, but Roche is interested in long reads sequencing. How will you use long reads sequencing in clinic practices? Will whole genome sequencing be used in clinic practices? And what kind of situation will doctors and research use whole genome sequencing in clinic practices? Thanks for that question. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I think this refers to the investments that Roche had previously made in the 454 technology, which is a, a technology which is particularly suitable for, um, for long reads. Um, but uh, if you see, um, or if you consider the, uh, the collaboration which we have with uh, Foundation Medicine, um, this is a, uh, a technology or the, uh, the technology that Foundation Medicine used for their, um, uh, um, for their essentially clinical sequencing approaches is all based around um, short read sequencing um, using technologies such as uh, uh, Illumina's uh, technology to, um, uh, to profile patients. And um, uh, I think this is the uh, beginning to be the, uh, the dominant technology which is being used in, in clinical practice to, to profile tumors. Thank you. We do have another question. What role should empowered cancer patients play in helping to evolve the regulatory process? Uh, thank you. So I'm looking at the next question. Um, what role should empower cancer patients play in helping to evolve the regulatory process? Um, uh, I think that's uh, an extremely good question and um, 
Uh, I think there's, there's two or three very important roles that patients can play. Um, I think the first is that um, particularly empowered and informed patients um, uh, should engage with uh, regulatory agencies um, um, through the vehicles which are open to them. So there's, uh, um, you know, for instance, bodies, patients, uh, patients like me um, uh, is, is one body which will allow, uh, allows patients to achieve a voice. Um, but they should be, uh, I think, um, uh, very outspoken in terms of um, explaining to regulators and to industry and uh, potentially to investigators uh, how they um, uh, experience uh, uh, treatment and uh, how they also experience uh, molecular analyses, how they, um, they view the risks and benefits of uh, um, the various approaches which are um, being weighed up by, um, by regulatory agents, agencies. And I think one of the most important roles that uh, um, cancer patients can play is to allow their data to be, um, to be used um, by investigators, by, um, by industry, to inform them on the performance of uh, existing therapies and also to, uh, to inform um, the, uh, um, the public space, so the, the, the public at large, and as I said, industry, uh, investigators, um, and academia, uh, where um, un unmet need is available or what unmet need is still there and um, uh, how they all, again, how they view um, experimental medicines in this space and, uh, and uh, what, what the, the, the balance that should be achieved by regulatory agencies. So if I look at the next question, We do have another question. How can a patient benefit directly from this technology? Can new drugs be developed readily for that patient? Because drug development takes a long time. No, I, I think that's, uh, uh, a, that's again a good question. Um, I think the, the major way that um, benef uh, patients can benefit from this technology is by um, their uh, cancer being described accurately and therefore having the potential to um, to find the right therapy. Um, it may be an approved therapy or investigational therapy um, for their cancer. As the, um, the person posing this question uh, points out, um, it takes a long time to develop uh, new medicines, but um, uh, the most, probably the most important thing for patients is to, uh, to leverage existing knowledge and existing therapies as effectively as possible. And that's what this new technology allows them to do, to, to match their, um, their particular cancer to the currently available therapies. Thank you. Our next question. It would be nice to culture CTCs and screen for drug sensitivity to determine the most effective drug for individual patient. What is the latest progress in CTC culturing? Uh, looking at the next question, um, respective to, you know, to potentially culture CTCs and screen for drug sensitivity determine most effective drugs for patients. Um, uh, it's whether or not you, you, so, you know, I would guess here that um, the, the key uh, opportunity that this questioner is seeing is the potential for, um, for culturing uh, um, cancer stem cells, which can be derived from blood. Um, but there's a, I think, a, a key question whether or not these cancer stem cells uh, are um, adequately representative, representative of the, uh, um, the main tumor which a patient is suffering from. Um, in, these are all single cells, cancer stem cells, and will um, only represent a, a subset of a, uh, 
uh, of the um, of the various uh, clones which are um, which are present in a particular tumor and may give a um, a wrong picture and I think the other thing that we clearly understand is that um, the tumor microenvironment so that means the solid tumor in its context and the way this interacts with the um, uh, with the the microenvironment around it the, the blood vessels the um, the uh, um, also the immune system and the um, the cancer stoma is key to understanding how a, uh, a tumor will um, will respond and this cannot be replicated particularly well in a um, in a uh, in a culturing environment um, there are efforts being um, underway to to look at 3d cultures which will uh, uh, give us a better representation in, in a cultured environment but uh, um, these are still very early approaches and have yet to translate to um, um, to accurately um, seeing whether or not a particular cancer will respond to a particular therapy. So if I look at the next question. Um, um, we do have another question. Has the propensity for mutation escape been characterized by a set of molecular targets, especially beyond canonical tumor suppressor genes? I can't read the rest of that question. Sorry, uh, uh, beyond tumor um, suppressor genes, uh, I think we're still in the early days of this and understanding um, uh, exactly how um, mutation escape occurs and um, get a, a broad understanding of it. Um, uh, but uh, you know, we we clearly see that. Um, uh, where there is a, um, uh, um, I mean, we can model this to a degree um, in either in uh, uh, in culture or in uh, um, in more complex animal models uh, to get an understanding of how this tumor escape occurs, and uh, um, we're, we're beginning to get a, a better understanding of this. But it's, uh, I think, it's relatively early days yet. So looking at, looking at the Okay, I'm afraid we're coming close to our time. We're gonna to have to have this be our last question. How safe is it to imply NGS plus biomarker baskets clinical trial approach in terms of side effects of a new potential drug? Is there a chance to observe side effects in a part of selected patients for a trial due to unique genetic background of the patients? I think that's an excellent question. Um, well, that's a it's an excellent question. Um, the the toolbox that we currently have for matching um, therapies to patients, uh, I think the the questioner is is pointing out that uh, if we simply uh, think in terms of efficacy, uh, we um, we're not seeing the whole picture. And it's important for us to get a, a much richer understanding of uh, um, not only how uh, combinations can be beneficial in terms of uh, um, attacking particular um, tumor drivers, but also what the um, what the potential is for drug-drug interactions, for uh, for synergistic action between drugs, not on uh, not in terms of uh, beneficial effects, but in terms of uh, adverse effects. Uh, and we're, I think, just beginning to develop the toolbox, um, which we're going to require to do this. Uh, but it's going to be a, um, a complex undertaking. Uh, we're going to have to think, uh, I think, more richly in terms of um, uh, clinical pharmacology approaches to, to support decision making here. And um, I think we're also going to have to do a, um, a uh, um, um, a, a much better job of recording uh, adverse events um, or, or novel um, adverse interactions, uh, sorry, adverse uh, actions of drugs in novel combinations.
Thank you, Dr. Metcalf. I would once, like, once again like to thank you for your presentation and ask you if you have any final comments for our attendees today. And no, just uh, to thank everybody for their attention and uh, um, you know, perhaps the only uh, uh, final comment would I, I would have is that uh, this is a, um, a rapidly moving space. Um, there are um, important considerations for public health uh, involved in many of these decisions. Um, I'm sure many of the people here have, uh, have um, seen uh, things such as the um, um, cancer moonshot from, uh, which is being promoted by Joe Biden and uh, um, President Obama's uh, Precision uh, Medicine Initiative. And I think it's extremely important that uh, not only um, scientists, but also the, the wider public uh, uh, become involved in this dialogue because it will um, have an, an important impact upon how we're able to, uh, to treat cancer going forward. Thank you once again, Dr. Metcalf. Very important information to bring to us today. I'd also like to thank Lab Roots for making this educational web seminar possible. Before we go, I wanna let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through the end of August, 2016. You'll receive an email from Lab Roots alerting you when this broadcast is available for live replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again. Goodbye.